Tom Cowie is visiting us from Adelaide and he has agreed to give this lecture, the title thereof being God Created the World for a Reason. And he's asked that we should read from the second letter of the Apostle Paul to Timothy in chapter 3 and then go forth to a few verses in chapter 4. So it's, well those words, friends, are a fitting introduction to the lecture that will be given by my brother, Mr. Ron Cowie, God Created the World for a Reason. Good afternoon, my respected friends. The Christadelphians are very glad that you've come along this afternoon to hear this most important topic, God created the world for a reason. So who are the Christadelphians? Well, we are a group of unpaid Bible students who believe that the whole Bible, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, is the word of God. We believe this is the maker's instructions to people who live upon the earth. No one here is paid. We don't go after your money. Our sole desire in inviting you here today is that we might share with you the Bible-based hope that we have come to know and to love. And the Christadelphians are entirely Bible-based. We have no other revelation that we will try and impress upon you. We take the word of God as being the total message that God gave for people to understand. And we read those words, from a child you've known, the Holy Scriptures, which are able or powerful to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration. It's a direct revelation from God. And it's profitable for the things we, we believe, for our doctrine our correction, our instruction in righteousness. So we turn to the Bible for the answers to the questions that we will raise. Now there's two distinct parts to our topic this afternoon. Firstly, that God created. And as our chairman intimated, that means we're going to very briefly show you why evolution, as preached by the world, is not correct, but also why believing in a creator God is. And then we will focus on the second part as to the reason that God created. So the first question is, can we really believe in a God the Creator today? How is it that we as Christadelphians stand here and disagree with the accepted science that is preached in all universities and educational institutions except for perhaps religious schools? How is it that we stand up and say, that those people with their ideas of evolution are wrong. Well, without going into all the complexities of the argument, let's just take the undeniable facts. Something every intelligent human being can see for themselves. With our modern understanding of our universe, we realise that there is a universe that exists and it has very, very regulated orders and laws by which it operates. Our Earth is placed perfectly within that universe and it has over a hundred unique factors about it that enable life to exist on this planet and as far as we know, this is the only planet that has those conditions in the right balance. Our Earth sustains an amazing array of intelligent and highly complex life. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. And then there is ourselves. You know, the human race are highly developed as far as our minds and our capacity to think about things is concerned. We have not only the ability to reason, but we also have an, ab an ability to understand God and to think about things like love and righteousness and hope and faith. We have a moral sense as well as intelligence. Which makes us ask, of course, why is it 
that such beings are here. And the Bible exists. You know, the Bible is in every country in the world. But the Bible exists. We have a book that has become universally accepted as being God's word. And so we have an explanation given to us for the fact that the creation is here. So faced with those undeniable facts that we are here in the universe, that we're very special creatures that have reasoning power, let's find out what alternatives we are faced with. Observing what we see, you can only go two courses of action. Number one, accepting what the Bible says, that there is a God who created by miraculous power which we can't understand or explain. So a great being, an intelligent being with a purpose, set everything that we see in the universe and all the universe around it, God did it all by his power. Or the second alternative is you're left to face what many men like to accept, which is called Darwinian evolution, atheism. No God, but everything we see just happened to come into being, to become such a wonderfully balanced planet that can support life, populated by such intelligent creatures as ourselves, and it all happened purely by chance with no reason for it to be here. It just happened, but even more spectacularly, everything you see around you in the wonderful universe came to be from nothing. Now some people think it takes a lot of faith to believe in God. It takes a much, much more faith to believe that something came out of nothing and became as beautiful and as carefully put together as what we see. That takes a lot more faith than to believe that there's a God. So we go to the Bible to see what the Bible says. Two vital Bible statements. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a reward of those that diligently seek him. So the very first base in getting towards God is to accept the fact that there is a God. You will never prove beyond any reasonable doubt that there's a God. There's mountains of circumstantial evidence that witness to the existence of a God. But if we could prove to the scientists' happiness that there was a God, then there would be no need for faith. There would be no need for belief. You must believe. And you believe because you look at the evidence which is compelling that there is a God. And if you believe in God, then you are faced with the opening statement of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that, my dear friends, is the most challenging opening to any book that's ever been written. God starts off on the front foot. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that has enormous implications for everything else you read in the Bible because what you have now is the maker's instructions. So that's what the Bible says we must do. We must believe that God exists. But the contrast to that is to accept the doctrine of evolution. Now evolution is a totally unproven and unscientific theory. And if we had the time we could go into both those statements in great depth. But it is unproven and it's unscientific. It's an attempt by man to explain how God, how life came to be, but working from the premise that there is no God and could be no God, a refusal to accept any chance of there being a God. So we have to come up with a reason, an explanation of how the beautiful world and universe came to be there, but we're not going to talk about God. And that's where evolution starts from. There's no reason for it to be here, it just is. So that's the choices you're faced with. You can believe that there is a God who created or you can believe that everything you see just happened by pure chance. So why is evolution so popular? Well, one of the reasons evolution is so popular is that most academic, that is, educational institutions are funded by secular or human-based governments. So... Those institutions and all scientists are obliged to support the generally accepted but godless ideas to get funded. And there's plenty of evidence of this fact that if you are in an academic institution and you get up and say you believe in God, your funding, your job will be on the line. 
because the pressure from governments is that in those institutions which they fund, they will not have God taught. And the reason men don't want to face up to the possibility of a creator God is because if there is a God, then there's probably a reason why, there's, why the earth is here. Because people don't make things without a reason. Evolution gains traction because its theories, and I repeat, its theories are constantly published as facts and therefore they gain a credibility they don't deserve. Professor Henry Morris said this, the main reason that most educated people believe in evolution is simply because they have been told that most educated people believe in religion. What we're now seeing though is that the deeper and deeper that scientists go, the more detailed is their knowledge of things like DNA and the human genome the more intricate their instruments to measure the things that are in the creation. That more and more of the great scientists are renouncing their evolutionary beliefs and are starting to believe in what they call intelligent design. Because they can see that it's completely impossible for these things to have happened by chance. But the majority of the world thinks, well, because we've been told that people believe it, therefore we will go along with it also. So what did Darwin bring to the world that has given men a way to ignore the Creator? Well, I'm going to give you a thumbnail sketch of what evolution is so you understand what we're talking about when we say that it's wrong. It's a theory formulated by Charles Darwin back in the 1860s onward. It has the concept of the spontaneous generation of life. So life just started out of nothing. There was some big bang, but they can't tell you what went bang, but there was something that went bang, and it threw glumps of rock out into the universe, and eventually on that, those rocks, water formed, and then water turned into acid, and in that little puddle of acid, some, the right acids got together at the right temperature, hit by a bolt of lightning, and you had a, a cell. And that cell had the power to replicate itself and improve itself. And from that cell, we end up with something as complicated as the human eye. Well, if that's a fairy story, I've never heard one. It's incredible people could think that. But Darwin put up the idea that it was a spontaneous generation of life. And then through natural selection, so this happened many, many times over, and the best or the most fittest ones survived. And then they would have a mutation, which somehow would be preserved into the next generation, which mutations really are. But they would be preserved to another generation, and so they would change or evolve. And then eventually they would form new species. So the fish would decide it would go out onto the land, it would crawl around for a while and then it would see, well perhaps if I jumped off that tree, you know, the fish then becomes a lizard and then it goes and jumps off a tree and decides to grow feathers and become a bird. Or it just happened that there was a particular lizard that had a feather grew on it or something. You've just got to think of the ridiculousness of the idea that there's an upward evolution of species. Survival of the fittest. So when Creatures come along in the evolutionary scale that don't fit in, well then they die out and the best ones live on. But the whole thing has a total reliance upon incredible degrees of chance. You know, I couldn't write on that screen, even if I wrote in small type, I couldn't write the odds against one cell forming by chance, given the fact that something existed to come together. You know, the odds against this sort of chance are just totally and spectacularly unbelievable. As has often been said, the odds of one cell forming by chance are like having an explosion in a printing factory and having landed at your feet a full copy of the Oxford Dictionary. Or having an explosion in a junkyard and suddenly flies out a jumbo jet. That's about the odds of the chance of just one cell forming even if the chemicals were there to form it. And no one's ever been able to replicate that. So these things get a lot more credibility than they deserve. You know, Charles Darwin himself was greatly surprised by the response to his theory of evolution. He said this, I was a young man with unformed ideas. I threw out queries, suggestions, wondering all the time over everything to my astonishment, 
The ideas took like wildfire. People made a religion of them. And because humanity was looking for a way to get away from what they saw as God's requirements of them, that God expected them to be certain types of people, men grabbed evolution to say, here's an explanation that gets rid of God out of our lives. Look what it says in 2 Timothy 4 verse 5. Or verse 3. For the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, sound teaching, but after their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They want their ears scratched. They want to hear the things they want to hear. And they'll turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned under fables. And evolution is a fable. Even Darwin was surprised by the reaction he got to it. And these are the reasons why we say that evolution will fail because it has huge gaps in its credibility. It cannot explain where matter began. It cannot explain what it was there to go bang in the first place. It can't explain how life then generated upon this planet Earth. There's no intermediary fossils between the species that there should be. They still haven't found them. Species may vary by selective breeding. You can take dogs and breed something from a chihuahua to a Great Dane, but they're still dogs. You can breed within a species, you can change a species, but you can't ever change a dog into something else. So there isn't any possibility of species evolving upwards. Mutations do not continue or improve a species. They are normally degenerative. And they are very, very rarely passed on to a future generation. The mathematical odds are completely, uncalculably impossible. The history of evolution has been littered with frauds, people trying to put up all kinds of false skeletons and false fossils, false theories, false experiments, because it was profitable for them to do so. They got fame and they got money out of promoting evolution. And there's an incredible optimism about the scientists. Well, we haven't found the evidence yet, but we know it's just around the corner. One day we will find it. And of course their dating methods by which they date things are highly suspect and fallacious. We're not going to go into trying to attacking all the theories of evolution today. What I want to do is to give you the evidence to believe in the creator. Our title says God created for a reason. These are the reasons why you should believe there is a God the creator. Circumstantial evidence to believe in God. The absolute perfection of conditions upon this earth is I think one of the greatest reasons to believe that God is the designer. There is a magnificent and intricate creation. Animals have inbuilt instincts. Animals work with each other. They work with plants. They work with insects to make sure that life is perpetuated. It all indicates a creative intelligence behind it. They have complementary resources. You know, there's a thing called a sea anemone, which is poisonous to all fish except the clownfish. The clownfish swims around within the tentacles of the anemone. When another fish attacks the clownfish, the anemone kills that fish, devours it, and then feeds the clownfish. You see the complementary nature of those two things working together. And then we have, as a further witness to God, a reason to believe in God, the fact that a man came to this earth 2,000 years ago called the Lord Jesus Christ. Of the miracles he did, of the men whose lives were changed by him, and of the fact that he rose from the dead. And those things are facts you can prove. You know, that thing about there, the indications of creative intelligence... There's a man that did appears so often on documentaries called David Attenborough. I'm sure you've heard of him. For 50 years, he's been telling people about all the wonderful things that are in our planet, all the wonderful animals and plants. And he always tells you about how they evolved. He has now publicly admitted on television that he now believes in intelligent design. 
Because he's smart enough to know that nobody with any sense of reason could go on perpetuating what he's been perpetuating, that it all happened by chance and by evolution. So even David Attenborough, and you can, if you want to Google it up on YouTube or something, you can find David Attenborough's confession that he now believes in intelligent design. He hasn't gone so far as to say he's going to obey God, but he can't accept evolution anymore as the, as the, as the reason for spontaneous generation. So when we come to God, God's very clear about what he says about himself and his will. He created in six days. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed it, he made the earth, he established it. He created it not in vain. It's not here by chance. He formed it to be inhabited. So God says, I made a world that I'm going to put people on it. It's a sign between you and me, says God, and the children of Israel, that six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And again, New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the beginning of the creation which God created. No matter where you go in the Bible, the Bible says God made the world, the universe, and everything in it. You know, God says this, I created it not in vain. So let's look at the planet. Look at this beautiful planet you can see from space. Let's just think about some of the things that show to us that there's intelligent design behind it. There are at least 122 factors that are known that make life on earth a possibility. 122 that we know about, any one of which you change and life could not exist. Any one of them you vary to a very slight degree. You know, some, someone once said, if you actually had a piece of string going from here to the sun, 93 million miles, and you took one inch out of it, that is all the variation you would need, you know, that degree of variation, one inch in 93 million miles would be the variation you would need to unbalance the tension between the expansionary force of our universe and the force of gravity which is contracting. That's how finally balanced our universe is. That that little tiny variation of the tension, everything would cease to exist. That's how finally balanced it is. Some more facts about the Earth. The Earth is exactly the right distance from the Sun. Any closer, we would burn. Any further away, we would freeze. It has an ozone layer. You know, the ozone layer is only very thin, but it's out there. It protects us from the sun's harmful rays. If our Earth were just 10% larger or smaller, life couldn't exist. We have on this planet oxygen and water, not found on any other planet. The moon is exactly the right side for the essential tides and winds. The earth is tilted in axis, which gives us the seasons in their turn. And we could go on because there are 122 factors that make life on earth possible. And they all have to be there, and they all have to be in exactly the right balance, and they have to work with each other. You know, it's an incredibly complex design. The earth has a precise magnetic field. The rotation of the earth matches human sleep patterns. The relative size of the sun and the earth and the existence on, on, on earth of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. Not just the fact that they exist, but the fact that they exist in the major substance. Now, I don't expect you to understand all the chemistry of this, but this is from a fellow called Loris Henderson, a world-renowned biologist. There is in truth not one chance in countless millions of millions that the many unique properties of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and especially their stable compounds, water and carbonic acid, which chiefly make up our atmosphere, there's no chance in millions of millions that they should simultaneously occur in all three elements. So he's saying if the odds of these things just happening to be in the three major elements that make up our atmosphere, they've all got those three in them, and they're simultaneous. There must be a law that connects them. These are no mere accidents. 
So you see, there are plenty of intelligent scientists that look at this and say, you've got to accept that somebody designed this. It's just too incredibly wonderful. You've probably heard of Stephen Hawking. The odds against the universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think clearly there are religious implications wherever you start to discuss the origins of the universe. There must be religious overtones. But I think most scientists prefer to shy away from the religious implications. You certainly got that right, didn't you? They just don't want to go there. So we say to you, ladies and gentlemen, it takes more blind faith to believe in spontaneous evolution than to believe in a creator God. Okay, well, why do we believe in God? You imagine walking along a remote beach and finding a phone lying there that you'd never seen before. You press a button or two and it comes on. And it says you have, e you have mail, you have messages. You hit an app and you get the weather come up and you think, oh, this is interesting. You can read the news. And then somebody comes along and says, you know, that just formed itself out of the sand that was on the beach. All the right little bits and pieces came together at the right quantities and it all came together and it just, it works. And would you believe them? Well, life is far more complex than a mobile phone. And God says, just look. I'm going to look at a couple of things. 3,000 years ago, God said this to a man called Job. He says, have you, have you entered the treasures of the snow? Have you seen the treasures of the hail? And he was saying to Job, there are things, Job, that you just don't know about. Now, we can know what God was talking about because we have a microscope. We can go down and look at snowflakes. You put a snowflake under the microscope and there's two remarkable things. Number one, they've never found two snowflakes that are identical. And secondly, every snowflake is based on a six-sided construction. There's one. Isn't that beautiful? You know, God said to Job, have you seen the treasures of the snow? We know what he was talking about. I'll just give you a few examples. Never two the same. So, isn't that remarkable? The treasures of the snow. God also said to Job, Ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls are there, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. So look at the creatures that God has made. Who knoweth not in all these things that the hand of the Lord has wrought this? So God says, go to the creatures, go to the insects, the birds, the animals, and ask. Well, let's just show you a couple of examples. How do geckos walk anywhere? They can go up walls, they can walk upside down across your roof. They can even walk on glass upside down. How can they get a grip on glass? Well... God actually talked about the geckos in the Bible. Unfortunately, because the translators in 1611 didn't know what a gecko was, they put in the word spider, because they knew what a spider was. They'd never seen a gecko. But it should be a gecko. There are four things upon the earth exceeding wise. The, the gecko taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. So the Bible said, look at the gecko for an evidence of the fact that God is a wonderful creator. Exceeding wise. Again, not just our microscopes, but now our incredibly super microscopes, we're starting to understand the gecko, why he can walk like he does. Only possible with modern technology to understand God's creative genius in the gecko. Well, they have millions of microscopic hairs on their feet, so small that they can attach themselves to the molecules of the surface of glass. You and I, we rub a hand on glass and say it's perfectly smooth. Put it under a microscope and you will start to see there are little indentations between the molecules. And the gecko can get this little hair down inside that little gap. Because each microscopic hair on his, on his toes then splits into about a billion others called spatulae which act like an adhesive. To show you that in representation. So you start with a foot and you take just one toe of the foot, you go down to the blue square, you take one line of the hair on his foot, you blow it up and you've got this ceta array. You blow that up, that little red square up, and you've got the ceta 
Well, you blow those up and you've got these spatula. A hundred million of them on the foot of a gecko. And we couldn't see those until a few years ago. Because they're, they're so small that you can't see them. So we have these millions of contact pads on the gecko's foot. It looks something like a wheat crop. Well, here's some facts that are interesting. A gecko can support itself hanging from the roof on just one toe. That's how strong the grip is. One hair alone could take the weight of an ant. Just one hair of the million on his toe can take the weight of an ant. And this is even more amazing. You could take a fully grown man and you could hang him from the feet of a gecko. Of course, providing the gecko didn't fall in half. But what it's saying is the tension that could be created by the gecko's feet could support the weight of a human. So you get some idea of the power of the grip of the gecko. And God says, you go to the gecko and look. He's wonderfully made. He's been made with wisdom. Well, let me take another example. We, we could choose millions of these examples to show you the beauty and the intricacy of creation. The Japanese honeybee. Now, the Japanese had bees in, in their, their country for hundreds and hundreds of years. The bee in Japan has one natural enemy called the Japanese hornet. You can see how big the hornet is there compared to the size of your bee. And these creatures love eating bee larvae, so they attack beehives to get at the larvae. The Europeans, when they got to Japan, they said, well, look, these Japanese bees don't produce as much honey as European bees, so we'll bring in European bees. And the hornets decimated the and just cleaned out the European bees every time. Every time they would just take them all. They thought, well, how can the Japanese bees survive and they just eat all of ours? So they watched the difference. So with the European bees, along comes the hornet, and the, the European bees rushes out, the soldiers rush out, and they try and fight him head on. And he crunches them up one by one until they're all dead, and then he eats the larvae, destroys the hive. Very courageous, very brave, but totally useless against that hornet. They try and sting him, but of course he's a lot bigger and stronger than they are. So then they say, well, what do the Japanese bees do? Well, this is how the Japanese bees tackle this hornet. So here's a hornet torn up, and this is what happens. The local bees don't try and sting him. They just all bunch around him. That's what they do. They jump all over the hornet and totally enclose it in a mass of bees. They then vibrate their bodies so that the temperature of the pack heats up to 47 degrees. The hornet cannot stand more than 45, so he dies at 45 degrees. They could go to 48, but they know to get it regulated to 47 degrees. So the hornet doesn't even go back to his wasp nest to tell them where the beehive is. He's, he's actually cooked by the bees. And that's how the little bees can defeat the hornet without having to try and fight him on. How did they work that out? It takes a lot of interesting experiments to find out that that worked, wouldn't it? But you see, that's where design shows up. And God says, you look at the creation and you know that I am behind it because it's intelligent design. And the imported bees never ever got to work it out. Quite amazing, isn't it? Here is an example of the Japanese bees suffocating the hornet. And it says in Job, who would put wisdom in the inward parts? And there's a whole bundle of Japanese bees just saying, let's cook him. And that's what they're doing. And it shows you how intelligent God's design is and how he put those two creatures living in the same locality with a defence mechanism that worked. If evolution was true, we'd have nothing in the world but hornets because they would have killed all the bees. It's not the way God designed it. In that location, there was a, a hornet and a bee that are complementary to each other. Okay, well, that's God's challenge to us. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts? We could talk all about nature in many ways. We could talk about inborn instincts. How do birds know to migrate? Homing instincts. Birds can get up and work out. You put a pigeon, stick him in a box, send him to Alice Springs, let him out, he goes up, zip, zip, straight back to Perth. How do animals know that? The amazing sense of smell. How moths and butterflies can find their mates from miles away. 
and the amount of scent they put out you can't even measure, but they can smell it from miles away. The foreknowledge of the weather, animals know when the weather's about to change, they can read when the barometer's falling. Bats by radio location can find their prey at night. And camouflage, you know, animals are given incredible camouflage. What do you see there? It's like a bunch of leaves, doesn't it? What's actually there is that creature. See him there? There's a lizard there. <laughs> Even the eyes are camouflaged. And you see, this is what God does. He's given that incredible creature the ability to sit there and look like a leaf, exactly the same colouring as the leaves around him. And like most Shebelians, he can change his colour to whatever he's sitting on. So how can you do that? Does he just look at it and say, well, I want to look like this leaf? But he's got that power to do that. It's quite amazing, isn't it? So God designs amazing camouflage. Blending in, changing colour to match. Even its eyes look like the leaf. Evolution can't explain how such a creature ever came to exist on the earth, let alone survive. But you see, God made it with that intelligence. Let's just come to the clincher. The last 50 years have seen a huge unlocking of the life code that control all the cells and mechanisms of our bodies. Could it just happen by chance? Well, this is what DNA is. This is a representation of what DNA is. It's a chain, <coughs> a woven together chain of atoms and cells that regulate life. Interesting, the Bible says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, or woven together, as the, as the Hebrew means. And there's the, the woven chain of DNA. Every one of those little things represents a different message, a different pathway. They have to be in exactly the right order, in exactly the right combination, touching exactly the right molecules. And your DNA, if we laid it out in a line, would stretch around the earth. And every one of them has got to be in the right order, in the right place. So when scientists discovered DNA, it's actually changed many scientists to believe in God. So Anthony Flew was a renowned atheist who recently came out and said, I can no longer accept atheism. It now seems to me that the findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful argument for design. Investigation of DNA is shown by the unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life, that intelligence must have been involved. I have to go where the evidence leads. And you see, many scientists are now coming to see that you can't go on believing in pure chance. Professor Andy McIntosh, the logical coded machinery of DNA and the information system it carries shout design to an unprejudiced mind. Evolutionary thinking is now teetering as a way of looking at the evidence. Not because of one or two isolated problems, because the whole structure is scientifically wrong. We're getting some courageous scientists now coming out and saying they can't accept it. So how did life come? You know, Darwinism can't explain how life came. Darwinian science says it just happened spontaneously. Some mineral soup was on the earth and it decided to have a cell and that evolved upwards. But it can never explain the complex coding of DNA. You know, when they pressured Richard Dawkins, you might have heard Richard Dawkins, he's the leading new atheist. These guys have made a fortune out of selling books and attacking religion. When he was quizzed on BBC television in a debate about how DNA could be explained by chance, he said, well, even I have to accept, said Dawkins, that it can't be chance. So where did it come from? Well, he said, perhaps some space travellers planted the seeds of life and DNA upon the earth. So even the leading atheist in the world, Richard Dawkins, has to say, well, somebody designed it and brought it here. That's amazing, isn't it? And yet so many people in our world still believe in evolution that it just happened by chance. Just take the human eye. We'll run quickly through this. The human eye is one of the most incredible things you'll ever come across. The Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. 
The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made both of them. God says, look at these things. Your eye and your ear are most incredible mechanisms. Could it just happen by chance? An amazing thing like that human eye, with all the different layers and all the different veins and nerves coming into it. I'll give you a few facts about the eyes. At conception, a million optic nerves grow outward from the eye and from the brain. And like fibre optic cable, they have to find each other. They grow together through the flesh until they find each other and connect up to each other. And they do it for both eyes in your head. Our human eye can adjust at phenomenal speeds to light variations, spherical and chromatic aberrations, distance and movement. For example, if there was someone at the back of the hall and I said, here's a tennis ball, catch it, their eye would adjust hundreds of times as that ball travelled the length of the hall in less than a second. And if the ball was going to one side, the, the, the eye would, would calculate where that ball was going to end up so that they put their hand out there and have it in the right place. And that takes hundreds and hundreds of calculations. And if that ball was curving, they would still see it going and they would be adjusting where their hand was. And our human eye is capable of making those calculations and telling the brain what to do in, an, in a fraction of a second. You see, the eye is a remarkable thing. Some more facts about the eyes. We have 2 million working parts in your eye, 8 million cone cells to detect, detect colour, 20 million rod cells to detect contrast. We can work out 500 shades of grey. That's how susceptible we are to variations. We, we blink 4.2 million times a year. That's an interesting fact, isn't it? Our eyes don't need any rest. They're always 100% ready. And our eye muscles are 100 times stronger than they need to be for what they have to do. And the lens can change shape for different distances and our pupils open up and close up for different light. You know, what an incredible thing is the human eye. So we have the Bible's challenge. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible goes on to say that it's only a fool who will say in his heart, there is no God. Evolution offers no reason for us to be here. No future beyond the grave. No rational or plausible explanation for the amazing world that we see around us. It offers nothing. All it offers is an escape from responsibility. People love evolution because they don't have to worry about God. Evolution says all that happened by pure accident. The Bible says this, God's anger is being revealed from heaven against all impiety, which is godlessness, and against the iniquity of men who through iniquity suppress the truth. God is angry because the truth about him is being suppressed. It goes on to say, because what may be known about him is plain to their inmost consciousness. Any rational being has to admit that there's got to be a designer. He himself has made it plain to them, for from the very creation of the world, his invisible power and divine nature have been rendered intelligible and visible by his works. You know, God expects mankind to look at the creation and to say there must be a God. So why did God create this world? We now come to the reason. Well, God has a purpose with our earth. The Bible clearly states it. As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. God intends to progress this planet from where we are now to perfect it as an example of his creative power and to fill it with human beings who will be like him and part of his eternity. He's in the process of doing that. The earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we are a work in progress. God has a plan to glorify and perfect this earth. Just go past that one. How's God going to do it? Well, God's going to actually take control of the world in which you and I live in. Today, we are ruled by the various governments of the world. The time is coming when God will take over the rule of this world to begin the process of perfection. In the days of these kings, which we can show to you is our times, shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, 
and it shall stand forever. So the Creator says that there's a time coming when I will take control of the government of the world and I will bring this world to a state of perfection and it will last forever like that. The king of that kingdom is the Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, said the angel to Mary his mother, bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and be with the son of the highest and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. That was the throne over the kingdom of Israel. He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. An everlasting kingdom ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ is God's way of bringing this earth to its destiny. God hath appointed a day, said the Apostle Paul, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. So the time of transition when God moves mightily to bring the Lord Jesus Christ back to the earth, when God takes over the authority over this world, is going to be a time of judgment for the world. And the man he will send is the one he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you to heaven, shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. And in the New Testament alone, there are over 200 references to the coming of Christ. It's going to be a forcible takeover. Therefore wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. My determination is to gather the nations that I may assemble the kingdoms. In other words, God's going to have a fight with the kingdoms of this world to pour upon them my indignation, even my fierce anger. For all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. And then will I turn to the people a pure language, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. So there's going to be a forced takeover of our world, followed by an education program, the people coming to understand the God who made this world and why he made it. A new world order is coming. It was the gospel preached by the apostles. Acts chapter 3, Peter preaching on the day to the crowd in Jerusalem. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ who before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution or restoration of all things spoken of by the holy prophets since the world began. We can go back to the prophets of Israel and find out exactly the process and the outcome that God has intended for this world. And there is a time when this will begin to pass. We need to find that out for ourselves. Now here's a summary of what lies ahead. This is the reason why God created our world. This is where it's all going. There's going to be an unprecedented time of trouble across the world in which time the Lord Jesus Christ will come. It would not take much to set off a world war. We have the aggression of Russia, the aggression of China, already evident. We have what's happening in the Ukraine. We have a shortage of resources all around the world. We have a very fragile economy right throughout the world. God says there's going to come a time of trouble which will bring the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to raise the faithful dead. All of those who followed God since the beginning of time will be raised from the dead. There will be a battle called Armageddon, which is God's battle against the nations, involving a worldwide war, and God will win. He will defeat the nations using the Lord Jesus Christ. He will then establish a worldwide government based in Jerusalem, His laws will extend to all nations and eventually peace and prosperity will come to the world. And there's going to be a thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ to complete that process. And there's a lot more things about that that we could tell you. But that gives you a summary of what God intends for our world. So God has created the world for a reason. We suggest that's a faith that makes sense. There is a God the creator. He's in control of our world. He will soon change the world for the better. And you can be there living forever. The evidence of things that are designed 
tells us there is a purpose. It is not sufficient, like David Attenborough, to say, well, I reject atheism. I reject the fact that it all just happened by chance. But be unwilling to move to the obvious conclusion. All he's willing to say is, well, I now believe there's some intelligent design. It might have been a spaceman. It might have been anything else. I don't know what it was, but something intelligent made the earth. If we believe that the world has been intelligently designed, then there has to be a reason. No one designs and creates something without a reason. You have to ask why it's here. And God says to you, you need to move, do something about it. There are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And we would love to have time to show you the promises that go through the Bible, which are the basis of God's plan with you and with the world. By these you can escape the corruptions in the world and be part of the divine nature. You can have eternal life. You can live forever in a body that will never die. But if you don't have those promises, you don't have that hope, you will see out your life or it might be cut short and you go to the grave and that's where you'll stay. That's what the Bible says. But we can be part of God's eternity if we accept those promises. So we need to be ready for the day when Christ comes back. Take heed to yourselves. Don't get caught up in this world with its pleasures and its drunkenness, the cares of this life, and the day come upon you and you're not ready for it. Watch and pray that you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are coming on the earth and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Remember the words we read in Timothy. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. You know, Paul believed that Jesus was coming back to set up the kingdom. We need to believe that. There's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, he said, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but all those that love his appearing. And we would urge you, ladies and gentlemen, take steps that you understand what's going to happen in your world. Understand what God is giving to you. Understand what the Lord Jesus Christ came for the first time and what it means to you. And be ready for his appearing. Where to from here? Well, the Christadelphians in this place would love to assist you to further understand the plan and purpose of God and how you can be part of it. You've only got to ask and you'll get all the help that you want. Search the scriptures. You know, in Acts chapter 17 and verse 11, there were a group of people who heard the gospel preached. Their response was to go home and to search the scriptures, whether these things be so or not. And it goes on to say, therefore many of them believed. And we leave you that challenge. Don't accept on face value anything I've said. Go home and read the Bible for yourself. Ask for help to understand it. And we trust that you likewise will believe that there is a creator and that he created the world for a reason. Thank you.